I turned 40 years of age in two weeks' time. Don't worry, no Porsche, no Botox, no lifts, <laughs> except for the ones I occasionally get to work. If I'm lucky, I'm only halfway through my life. I have much to achieve, and I'm excited to see my two daughters grow into strong, independent women. However, this frame of mind and this luxury of a long life hasn't always been the case. In 1900, just over a century ago, we humans were living on average to be just 50. If I, as a woman, managed to even make it through childbirth, poor nutrition, poor sanitation, pneumonia, diphtheria would have likely killed me. But the good news is, we humans now are routinely living to be 80 plus. Thanks to modern medicine and science, we have good sanitation. We have reduced infant and birth mortality, and we have fantastic vaccines against many otherwise lethal infectious diseases. But now that we're living longer and we're surviving these earlier challenges, we humans are faced with a whole new enemy, ourselves. A new category of diseases upon us, chronic inflammatory diseases, something only seen within our generations, and particularly in Western industrialised societies. So-called diseases of affluence and age. These include allergies, heart disease, and a slew of over 150 types of autoimmune diseases where our immune system becomes disoriented and attacks us. These include multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, type 1 diabetes, celiac disease, and lupus. These diseases don't get the attention that, say, cancer or Alzheimer's disease may get. But the current estimate is that 50 million Americans are afflicted with an auto-inflammatory disease. One in five of us have allergies. I can't put peanut butter in my kids' lunch. And the numbers of these diseases are rising at unprecedented rates. Fatigue, swelling, aching pain, skin rashes, People don't appreciate or understand the difficulties of patients living with these mostly silent and hidden diseases. You may have heard about some of these diseases via afflicted celebrity tennis players. Or those strange ads on TV advertising drugs talking about something called restless leg syndrome. But they're impacting more people than we know. In particular, there is a rapid rise in what used to be considered a rare disease of the gut, inflammatory bowel disease, especially in industrialised Western societies. Inflammatory bowel disease currently affects 3 million Americans. That is the number of school-age kids and college students in New England collectively. There currently is no cure. Strikingly, the rate of this disease has almost, almost doubled in less than 20 years. In fact, there are 100,000 new, new, new cases of inflammatory bowel disease every year in the United States, and this is expected to keep rising. Imagine a packed Dallas Cowboys stadium being newly diagnosed with IBD this year and next year and the year after that, and now imagine the rates of these diseases rapidly rising in newly industrialised China with 1.4 billion people, and in India with 1.3 billion people. There currently is no cure. Inflammatory bowel disease is a chronic relapsing inflammation of the intestine. There are two types, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. You can't tell they have it. You can't see the abdominal cramps, the bloody stool, the multiple trips to the bathroom or the living in constant fear if they'll make it through a movie or a work meeting. The lost days from school or work. And the shock and stress that goes with being diagnosed with a chronic inflammatory illness. And the side effects from drugs that try to alleviate the disease. So you might be wondering, what's going on here? The rates of these chronic inflammatory diseases is rising faster than can be explained by genetics. So clearly, there's an environmental component. But what? Our diet, our changing climate, urban environments? There's good evidence that we're not eating enough fibre. And 
We're too damn clean. And there's good evidence that these things disturb the microbiome, the ecosystem of bugs within our intestine. But precisely how these environmental triggers are impacting disease, and if it's the same environmental trigger in every patient, is unclear, and it frankly may never be clear. So you may ask, how can we possibly tackle a disease when we do not know the cause? And why and how does our immune system lose its way and make mistakes? Our beautiful immune system, our white blood cells, about 10,000 of them per drop of your blood. They originate in the bone marrow and circulate around our bodies, protecting us from infection and most cancer. We have the innate arm of the immune system, the first line of defence, the inventory in the trenches, that's literally been around for about a billion years, present in the earliest organisms on Earth. And then about 450 million years ago, our adaptive immune system evolved. And this is more like the special forces, with a sophisticated memory of past infections to be called on again. And both arms do an incredible job of protecting us from nasty bugs and keeping us alive. So why now does it start to make mistakes? And what makes it do this? Traditionally, to understand any disease, we have used the famous Koch's postulates. And that simply states that if a pathogen is causing a disease, then it's found in all individuals with that disease. And that pathogen can transfer disease, such as influenza. And we can train our special forces to combat that pathogen, and this is exactly how vaccines work. But we don't see the same pathogen in chronic inflammatory disease patients, nor does it, it, does it seem to be the exact same environmental trigger. So what about a more modern-day Koch's postulate, such as a causative genetic mutation, such as BRCA1 for breast cancer. Current evidence is that there are about 160 mutated genes that have been associated with IBD, but having one or many of these does not guarantee you'll get the disease. You have to have the bad combination of genetics plus the environmental trigger. So what do we scientists do and doctors do when we don't know the precise cause of a, of a disease? And we may never know this, and it might be different for everyone. Vaccines work when we know the pathogen. Removing disease-causing genes can work when we know the precise genetic causative mutation. We need fresh thinking and new approaches to these more complex diseases of affluence and age. I would like to propose that the clues and answers may be in epigenetics, the interface of your genes with the environment. We are in the post-genomic era. The human genome has been sequenced, a remarkable scientific feat. And we realised one major thing. Most of our DNA is not genes. It was somewhat like Christopher Columbus, who set out west from Europe to find Asia and instead landed in the New World. It was completely unexpected, but we couldn't have known that unless we embarked on that journey. Of your human genome, only 1% of it is actually transcribed into genes that become functional proteins. In an immune cell, as little as 200 unique genes are used. It is actually the silencing of the vast majority of your DNA, which actually totals six feet in length, that is critical to how cells gain identity, behave, and respond to the environment. That long strand of DNA needs to fit into a microscopic cell, and so here we have a physical packaging problem. In come histones, which are those molecular spools that DNA wraps around, and it enables efficient cramming of that DNA into this tiny space. And without them, our cells would look something like my four-year-old sock drawer, or if you ask my husband, my sock drawer. <laughs> These histones have molecular tags on them that give precise instructions that enable or prevent that DNA from being expressed in a cell-type-specific manner. And this we collectively refer to as the epigenome, where epi is Greek for outside of or above. Its role in regulating the on and off and timing of genes is partly functional and partly structural. 
I like to use the analogy of music to describe epigenetics. Mostly because my grandmother, pictured here, Kathleen, was a pianist. She also died of complications of a classic disease of affluence and age, diabetes. My wonderful husband is also a talented musician, and pretty much everyone in my family wonders what it is I do on a daily basis. <laughs> so, think of your human genome as a giant piano, and there's about 20,000 separate keys or genes. And sitting at that piano, deciding which of those keys gets played loudly or softly, or remains silent in different cell types, is your epigenome. Now, think of the most famous music sequence in a movie of all time. Jaws. <laughs> Two simple notes. <laughs> Played in that way, with the right timing, with all other keys silenced, it's so powerful. Now, in an innate immune cell, normally two keys are played. And this might go up to 10 following an infection, but it will rapidly go back to two. But everything you can think of, sleep or lack of, diet, alcohol, exercise, pollution, and certainly the bacteria in our guts, has influence on our epigenome. And this is a key insight. Collectively, over time, the music of our immune cells is gradually changing. In inflammation, it's like a cell that used to play Jaws is now playing more and more keys to something like a piano concerto or possibly something out of time and completely nonsensical. And in the last few years, we've just been able to analyse the epigenome of our immune cells. And this is revealing amazing insights. A recent study in identical twins found that by the time that we are 65 years of age, 70% of our immune epigenome is derived from the environment. Essentially, the music of our immune cells is being played in a whole different way, not dictated by the DNA you inherited from your parents, but from the environment in which you live. So what can we do with this knowledge? And how can we use this to treat or even predict chronic inflammatory diseases? Well, the beauty of the epigenome, unlike the genome, is that changes are reversible. And what's more exciting for the many patients suffering from chronic inflammatory diseases is that epigenetic enzymes can be manipulated with drugs. My research has shown that a molecule that sits precisely in the pocket of a very special class of epigenetic penis, known as the Broma domain epigenetic enzymes, could switch off inflammation. It stopped too many keys being played. And excitingly, these drugs are now in clinical trials for cancer, because cancer, like inflammation, cells lose their identity through changes in their epigenome. And while these drugs are offering hope to many cancer patients, these drugs could also be offering hope to the millions of patients with chronic inflammatory disease. My lab at Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School is seeking designated epigenetic enzymes for the immune system. This is in the hope of trying to find refined targets to precisely reset the immune epigenome back to jaws. But we also wanted to understand that if, in like cancer, changes in our epigenome could actually be a trigger of chronic inflammatory disease. What we found was that a very specialised immune-restricted epigenetic enzyme, its name is SP140, was lost in a subset of patients with inflammatory bowel disease. What happened in these patients was that the pores or the rest in their DNA of their music cells was eliminated. And ultimately, those cells lost identity, and a very specialised innate immune cell, the macrophage, lost its way. It forgot to have a protective role in the gut, and ultimately, over time, inflammation ensues. Interestingly, this same epigenetic enzyme is also lost in two other immune diseases, multiple sclerosis and an adult leukaemia. Clearly, there must be a different environmental trigger for three disease outcomes from the same environmental change. But now we have the knowledge 
and possibly the tools to predict this disease and try to reset that immune epigenome back to normal using epigenetic drugs. The last 20 years, we have witnessed a scientific revolution, with Boston and Cambridge playing key roles. The ability to sequence the entire human genome for a few hundred dollars. We can literally catalogue every single bit of DNA in patients with and without disease. And now, in the last five years, we can do something about that with CRISPR, molecular scissors to delete disease-causing genes. These two scientific feats have undoubtedly revolutionised modern medicine. But as a scientist, it pains me to say it, but they may actually be largely worthless in the context of these chronic inflammatory diseases. In order to truly understand the intersection between our genes, environment and disease, we need to be looking at our epigenome and finding ways to reset it. Epigenetics puts all of that genetic information into the right context. And the way to slow or reverse inflammation might be to, tell, to, to change the epigenome and what it tells certain genes to do. Autoinflammatory diseases are chronic and incurable. For inflammatory bowel disease, the current options are ineffective drugs with bad side effects, a scalpel to remove the diseased intestine, or persistent and debilitating relapses. Imagine a future if these chronic diseases of inflammation continue to rise at these alarming rates. As I celebrate my 40th birthday, I see new dangers in turning 40. But these dangers may be even greater for my daughters and for your children. My hope is that in the future, a trip to the doctor will include an analysis of your genetics and your epigenetics. And it will be this personalised medicine that can create tangible links between you, your environment, your lifestyle and the chronic inflammatory diseases you're vulnerable to, all on the cellular level. My ultimate hope is that we can identify an epigenetic tipping point, that we can try and reset that immune epigenome back to normal before it triggers disease. We're not there yet, but with the current pace of science in this city and beyond, and the visionary leaders in this room here tonight, I have absolutely no doubt that this can be achieved. Thank you.